Hello and welcome to the If We Knew Then podcast. I'm Stephen Sox. And I'm Lori Sox. And today we're joined by Jake Pratt and his mom, Kathy, and sister, Amy. I came across Jake's story on the internet, a video by UPS, about his time there as an employee. Jake is a 22-year-old man who played on his high school football team, attended college, has a girlfriend, holds down two jobs, and has dreams of starting his own family. And he also happens to have Down syndrome. Jake's is a story of possibility, ability, the power of inclusion, and the importance of advocacy. So, let's welcome Jake Pratt, his mother Kathy, and sister Amy. Jake, so great to have you here today. Oh, hey guys. Great to be here. Maybe we could start with uh, a little introductions. Uh, I am Jake Pratt. I am from Vestavia Hills, Alabama. And I'm 22 years old. And I'm his much older and much cooler sister, Amy Hodge, and I live in Spanish Fort, Alabama, but originally from Birmingham. Well, welcome both of you today. We're so happy that you could be here. I have so many questions. I, I was so intrigued. I believe Stephen's been following your story for a while, Jake, but um, he showed me the video that UPS made and it just, it just lifted my heart so much because Liam is our son and he's 11. And when Liam was born, we didn't really know anything about Down syndrome and anything that was out there really didn't inspire much hope. And so this has been a journey for us to explore and advocate and learn. And Jake, watching your video, um, you're much older than Liam and to see your story and how far you've come and where you are you, as a parent, it, it reiterates the beliefs and thoughts and hopes that I have for my son. So I was so excited that you guys were able to make time in your schedule to talk to us today. Yeah. Speaking on that, I know that when Jake was born, um, they did not receive his Down syndrome diagnosis until after birth. She had not done an amnio just because of the risk of miscarriage. And we didn't know until after Jake was born. And so we really didn't know anything. Just like you said, we knew nothing about Down syndrome. Um, I don't even think I knew anyone that had Down syndrome prior to that. So the doctor essentially came in and told my mom that they had a high suspicion of Jake having Down syndrome. And that he would never be independent, functional adult, that um, he might have to be institutionalized, just basically use the words, don't expect much, just painted a really, really bleak picture for my mom and my dad. She, it put her in a really bad place. And there was a really sweet nurse there that, that came in after the doctor had left and said, those things he said are not true. I want you to talk to some other people. And I have a friend who has a daughter with Down syndrome that I really like you to talk to. And I mean, mom said, I'm not ready to talk to anybody. She didn't want to talk to any friends. Didn't want to talk to any family. And um, that nurse, she wasn't pushy, but she just kind of kept saying, well, let me know when you're ready. My friend really wants to talk to you. And the friend had reached out to some people sort of in the Down syndrome community that she knew and ended up having Gene Stallings actually call my dad, who's a huge Alabama fan. He picked up the phone and he said he heard this booming voice. Hello, Jay. And he knew the voice immediately, like knew who it was without even asking. And, um, you know, Gene Stallings just talked to my stepdad and my mom finally kind of opened up and started talking to some other people in the Down syndrome community and found out that those things that that daughter were saying definitely weren't true. And she said she just made a resolution that she was going to treat Jake exactly the same as she had treated my sister and I, and that there weren't going to be limitations placed on him. And um, that was kind of the beginning of, of our journey with Jake. But 
just like you guys said, we didn't know a lot about gun syndrome. We, did, we, we didn't have resources. It was just really lucky that that nurse was put in the position where she was to be able to help my mom because it was a very hard time. Well, I think advocates are so important and so is information. I know now it's very important and I can only imagine, how old are you, Jake? 20? 22. 22 years ago. I can only imagine because I know that 11 years ago we received basically the same scenario before we start this, I always feel a little funny because I don't want to talk about you in third person. You are a big part of this conversation. And I'm always interested too in how you're impacted knowing that this was the experience that your your mom had receiving a diagnosis. Clearly, you've broken all of those um, limits that they put on you. But did it it has to does it affect you when you when you hear these stories of the limits that people put on you and the misinformation that they have about Down syndrome? Oh yes, ma'am. How do you feel about people with Down syndrome, Jake? I feel happy with Down syndrome kids. Uh, they can like go to college, and parents need to help their kids to reach their dreams. I think that's really important because. That's always one of our challenges is getting Liam the supports that he needs. And, and it is a, it is a, just like with any person, the importance of support is so apparent because there's a great difference between what is the perceived ability and the real ability. And for as positive as we are about things, um, we push Liam as hard as we can. And we have these, these thoughts of Liam uh, succeeding in so many areas. And there's still a little bit of doubt there if you don't see it, you know, uh, at least for me. And so coming across multiple videos of you, Jake, but that UPS little commercial was, was very inspiring. I mean, that was just wonderfully done and showed your ability and how your acceptance should be universal, that there should be no reason why you can't put a goal in front of you and succeed. Jake, do you want to tell them a little bit about your two jobs? Oh, yes, I do. So I got two jobs at the golf course, and my other job is UPS. At the golf course, I do maintenance crew, so I, like, pull out weeds, we mow greens, we blow debris, we fill in divots, and for UPS, I um, do boxes on conveyor belts now, like the warehouse. And you drive a golf cart? And then I drive the golf cart at the golf course. And Jake did get his driver's permit. I got my driver's permit. Uh, I want to tell you all the, uh, about the test. So I came in. My mom was in the other room. And then I passed. And guess what it gave me? What? A hundred. That is the written test? Yes. So he studied really hard. We had found some um, YouTube videos. And I taught him how to watch the video and watch, he would, he got the read aloud, you know, modification. And so he would watch the video and pause it when it got to the end of the question and he would try to answer it on his paper. And then he would press play again to see if he got it right. And then he would go through and grade himself and see which ones he missed. And then he would go back over the questions that he missed. And so you did that for what, several days, Jake, to study? Yes, I did. And then he went in and made a perfect 100 on the test. Which is a feat for anyone. <laughs> oh, yeah. And we, we talked about this. Actually, the little communication we've had, Amy, is that just preparing for success, you know, the, the prep work that needs to be done. But that's something that is a tool. And we all need prep. I mean, when I go into a, a room, a new room of people, and I might do that for myself or might have someone help me prep for a situation. But that support is really important. And, and Jake, you took advantage of that support and 100%. So the next step is learning the actual physical driving part. Well, he is driving already. So I mean, he's not taking his license test yet. We're not quite there yet, but he is driving. Um, he's, he, he drives with my mom and has done so on several occasions. I hear, I see mom over there. Yeah. Mom, feel free to join in. We also want to say hi. And we want to say hi. <laughs> great job, mom. Really great job. Um, I, I want to know the reception when he walked in to get his driver's license. Well, they actually uh, didn't treat him any differently at all. I just said, Jake's here to, to um, take the permit test. And we filled out the forms and she took him back 
to a separate room and I, I waited in the waiting room. Now I will go back and tell you how I trained him. I did a seven day intensive training session and this may sound tough, but I said, Jake, take these practice tests on your phone until you make a hundred. I don't care if it takes you one time or 25 times. And he would come to me and show me an 89 or a 95. I'd say, do it again, do it again. We did that every day for seven days. So by the time we went to, for him to take the test, he had been through all of the possible questions many times and he knew the answers. He, he like he said, he made a hundred on the test. Well, that's amazing to me because you know that it, one of the things that we face when, like you were talking about the limits that we're told about our children, going to college, living independently, having a job, having a relationship and driving a car, those are all, those are all on there. And I have to say, I love that when he walked in, he was treated like everyone else. That again, gives me hope because it's not necessarily the case. You know, Liam's in fourth grade going into fifth grade and he he definitely doesn't get that in, here in in his school. It's it's more, you know, questions why he's there trying to do what everybody else does. So I think it's amazing that he was treated as an equal. That that makes me really happy. Well, one thing I try to do is I don't encourage people. I don't give them opportunity to treat him differently, if that makes sense. I don't encourage that. When I come to someone or, or he's engaged in an activity, I don't go into a dialogue about he may be slower, but he can do it. I, I don't even go there. I treat him with the people I'm engaging with as a tip, you know, just to, this is another child that wants to play football. He wants to be on a team. He wants to perform this activity. So I really don't give them the opportunity to go there. And if they start to go there, then, you know, I don't like to engage heavily on that subject, but um, I will. I wanted to just say something um, about Clemson as far as what you were talking about, about how you see different people and just have different attitudes. Um, the one thing that really put it on my heart, you know, that Jake really deserved, needed to be at Clemson, that that was the place for him, um, was when we went up there for the open houses when he was in high school after we had found out about that program. And um, the Clemson Life program has been, has just become such a staple of Clemson in general, that it's just ingrained as a part of that community. And we went out to eat and it was like one of those things where you walk up and you tell them your order and then you go sit down and they bring you your food. And there's been times the person taking your order would look at me and say, well, what does he want to eat? And, you know, I'm like, ask him, I don't, I don't know what he wants. <laughs> and, um, you know, at Clemson, it was like, Hey, how can I help you? What would you like, sir? And, you know, Jake put in his order and you, you just notice a difference in that community. And we're lucky because really the community where Jake grew up, they have a, a very, very inclusive special education department. Um, they work really hard to make the students with special needs feel like they're just as important as their typical peers. Like Jake, I don't know if you want to talk a little bit about the club that you were in in high school. I was in Rebel Up. I was a president for the club and I teach other people. Also to foster relationships between students with special needs and their typical peers. And uh, Jake was co-president um, of that club for his senior year. Right. I just wanted to step back for a minute. Uh, I noticed when you were talking earlier about what Jake thought about having Down syndrome and how it has impacted him, um, he didn't really give a good answer to that because we didn't tell Jake he had Down syndrome. Jake did not know he had Down syndrome until the fifth grade. And that's because in his fifth grade class, his special education teacher did an inclusive video for the school. And it was such a nice video and they played it the whole school during an assembly. It, this was in middle school and it was for inclusion and she, put the uh, video on CD. And so Jake brought the CD home with him 
and me and my husband played that CD and it was Jake talking about Down syndrome. And, you know, I'll be honest, I cried when I watched that video because I had never told Jake at all. So, I mean, he learned at school, in middle school, that he had Down syndrome and what it was. And that wasn't like a conscious choice on my behalf. I just didn't feel the need for him to even think he had any limitations. And it's unfortunate that the thought of Down syndrome would be limitations. That's, I think that's the conversation that needs to change. We don't tell, I mean, we don't tell Liam he has Down syndrome. You know, we just, we just go through his life. Just there's, you know, it's just a part of who he is. I think it's more society and the conversation that we have when we're going into an IEP or there's, there's one of the services or supports. That's the only time we really talk about Down syndrome. You know, even our daughter, Sophia, who's just three years older, she didn't know what Down syndrome was because it's not, I think it's just a, a part of Liam. Yeah, we probably feel very similar on this. But yeah. how did you feel having the school have that conversation? And Jake, how did you, how did you feel? When you learn that you had Down syndrome, an extra chromosome, what did you think? Did you think it was a big deal? Yes. You did? I yes. mean, do you think it affects you a lot? Yes. How does it affect you? It makes me happy to have Down syndrome. And, and I mean, Jake, may have to study a little bit harder. It may take him five times to learn uh, how to do a task versus once. He may need to be instructed multiple times, but he can do anything. And that's the bottom line. And I don't think those things you just said are really just pertain to Down syndrome. I think it pertains to... A, a lot of people doing different acti- depending on what the activity is. But we don't quit on typical people. We don't. But we find that sometimes in our community. I don't mean to bring the whole whole thing down, but yeah. Yeah, we don't quit on typical people. We shouldn't. And when, when we say that, I mean, I consider Jake typical. Neuro, I should say neurotypical. Yeah, right. I agree with you that it's just so important for us to understand that people with Down syndrome have different strengths and weaknesses, just like any other person. And I think so many people don't understand that. They don't, you know, Jake and his girlfriend both have Down syndrome. They have completely opposite strengths and weaknesses. Jake is the social butterfly. He is the conversationalist. He's going to talk to everybody. Grace is very, very shy. She has to get to know you before she opens up and talks. She's very, very strong when it comes to like, written communication, whereas Jake is very strong when it comes to verbal communication. So, I mean, it's just like with any person, they're going to have different strengths and different weaknesses. And I think we've been very lucky with Jake's employers being willing to explore that and to find Jake's strengths so that he can, you know, contribute as a meaningful person in their organization. Um, That's something that is super important for us to understand, for people to understand that, like Jake wasn't given these jobs as a charity case, you know, um, Jake goes and he does a good job and he's a super hard worker and he makes valuable contributions. And, you know, I think that any person with Down syndrome can do the same thing if they're given opportunities that align with their strengths. I agree. You, you need to explore the strengths of each individual child and utilize their strengths to their advantage. And that's what we tried to do with Jake. Jake is strong. He's a physical person. He likes to be active. He's also very social. So those are his two strong points. So when we looked for a job, we just didn't look for any job. We looked for jobs that met his abilities and strengths. And the two jobs he has happens to fall in line. I've had other parents come to me and go, well, Jake got a job there. I want my child to get a job there. And my advice is, wait, just because Jake's working there doesn't mean it's a good fit for your son or daughter. Explore their strengths and utilize them to their advantage. 
Yeah, just like with anyone. I, I think that the conversation is about inclusion because we're having this conversation about things that we would never have with a narrow tip. You probably didn't have this conversation when Amy was going to look for a job, like just just give her that chance. And I think that it starts with inclusion at, at the educational and, and in society. And until we have that inclusion and when we can stop having this conversation about having to prove ourselves, because that's one of the things that I've noticed as being Liam's parent is that I'm always having to prove. I'm, I'm having to prove more for him than I do for my daughter. I have to like make these guarantees or he, you know, it's summer, he, he, got, he gets like a week and a half off and I've got a list and the things that he's going to be doing. I know that he will reach these on his own, but it's also because I know I have to track it. I know I have to, it's like a, a, a scientific proof to go in when I go into his IEP to show the improvement and the importance and how of- how he works and right. how, how to front load and stuff like that, yeah. But I think that it's the importance of inclusion because we're not truly included until we don't have to have these conversations where we're proving our value. And we have an episode with Dr. Scott Go, and we talked about employing people with Down syndrome and there's a, there's a I'll revisit it, there's a- a link to paperwork that you can bring in to your job to your job to say how many people with down syndrome do you have employed these are ways that you can employ people with down syndrome and also for parents who are looking or for people with down syndrome who are looking for a job to prepare them to get a job because yeah, for me I, I know uh, what i had, what i had heard is that jake you didn't tell anybody at down syndrome when you filled love that, that. that application i love and they it. hired you now after that there's a commercial that ups makes to say hey look we did this right but and that's fine I'm I'm totally fine with saying, hey, we hired someone with Down syndrome and this is how we're inclusive because I want that word to be something that other big companies want to do. That that okay, does that make you look good? Great. Then let's let everyone do that. If if it starts being something that, that a company looks good for doing, that's how we can make real progress too, because we we these little we have these little cogs trying to make, make the thing work, but we're going to need these big. But I think the focus isn't I'm going to do this to make me look good or look what I'm doing. I think it's just about society getting to a place where their minds are open to understand ability and equality because it's not a charity. It's not that you're doing no. this great do. It's how many people with Down syndrome went for so long unable to get a job because they were viewed in a certain way. I, I'm going to tell you again, Jake, I'm, I'm so you're, you're going through, you're on the forefront and, and you're doing these things. I you're love breaking the, down barriers. You're breaking down barriers for, for us, for our son, for Liam to go out and, and get a job. Because in, in 11 years, when he's your age, it will be, I have hope and faith that it will be different for him when he goes to get a job. I was just going to say one thing that UPS felt exactly the same way you did. They said, I, we, you know, we don't want it to look like we're just trying to get this positive publicity out of this because, hey, this is this is just a guy doing a great job that he was hired to do. Um, and I said, no, we, we want this. We want people to see what Jake's doing and, you know, that he's working for this major corporation and, do, and doing a great job because this is important. This story needs to be told. I'm like, awareness equals acceptance. That's the only way we're going to get to the point where this is commonplace. So plug away, you know, do your commercial, do whatever you need to do to get this out there because people need to see this. Yeah, people need to see that Jake's doing it. They yeah, need society to, needs to see it, right? But parents need to see it too because that's uh, we we all we all need that reminder, you know. You know that lift up, especially when you're going against so much that says no. To have that in your pocket that you just know, yes. And, and I think the one thing that struck me about the commercial that I did love, I just loved the tone of it all because it was, it was all ability. It was all inclusive. And the voice of UPS was, this is a young man who got a job and is doing a great job like you would do for employee of the month for any, anybody else. Um, the difference is, is that he's doing it against challenges that society puts on him that aren't real. And I guess it's your, a coworker from UPS that went to the golf course and he was talking about one of the main things is that it's different to get a job as a helper. But I think that a lot of parents and a lot of society put that as the limit. Like maybe this is what we can do because that's really all that's been offered up to us in, in, in a large majority, except for when we go out and break down a wall. And he said, that's different. But then to actually have 
a job. That's a, that's a big deal. And that's what you're doing. Jake, do you want to tell them about who Richard is? So my driver is Richard Wilson. He's a great friend of mine. So when I met Richard, we was working together for the holidays. So originally, Jake was working for the Christmas holidays, and he was on the UPS truck with Richard. That was his first position. It was a temporary position at UPS. And Jake, you were working, what, like eight hours a day when you were doing that? Sometimes more? Sometimes none. And um, then he was also still working his golf course job (laughs) in the mornings. So he did such a great job that um, they invited him to apply for a permanent position at the warehouse. Tell them about why you applied for the first job, Jake. So the first job at UPS, so my neighbors are Joey and Ray, and they told me to apply to UPS. So they worked at UPS and they had told Jake to apply for one of those positions because it's a good way to get your foot in the door. Um, But I mean, it was just a generic application. So he didn't put anything about Down syndrome because the application didn't ask anything um, about it. And so when he got hired on as a helper, um, they didn't know that he had Down syndrome. And um, the actual like manager of the hub, which he didn't know Jake had Down syndrome even when he hired him. And he actually said to Jake's driver, Richard, Richard said, you know, Jake has Down syndrome, right? And he said, what do you mean he has Down syndrome? I don't think he does. And Richard's like, yeah, yeah pretty, pretty sure Jake has Down syndrome. So um, like the manager of the hub didn't even know that Jake had been working there for what, like two weeks. And that was not intentional on our part. I assisted Jake fill out um, several applications for jobs and there wasn't a question on there. You know, there was a general question, do you have a disability? And I, of course, checked yes, but there wasn't a specific question, you know, for you, what, you know, what type. So they never asked me that. They never knew that. And, you know, to be honest, I believe that worked to our advantage. Maybe if they had known ahead of time, they would have had some preconceived ideas. But as it was, they didn't. And Jake came in and he proved that he could do the work. He was riding on the truck every day and he was the package runner. He would take the packages from the truck to the doors. Um, you know, he's, he likes to be active and walk. So he just proved that he could do the work. And they said the good helpers get offered jobs in the warehouse first. So that was the goal. And Jake, I want to talk all about school and football and your friends. But while we have mom here, I, I want to talk a little bit about education. You support, you said how you, you'll support Jake when he filled out different applications, but through his life in his education, can you talk a little bit about what that experience was? Well, I'm going to be honest with you. Jake got a good start with education he went to the RISE program in, at the University of Alabama in Tuscaloosa. And that's a program that Gene Stallings started after he had his son, John Mark. So you can go there from birth until kindergarten. So Jake started when he was three months old and I went back to work. I worked full time. And so Jake started at that program. It's a full time day program, I think those are hard to find. So he went early in the morning, he stayed all day. They began early intervention services with Jake. Everything was taken care of at the RISE program. I I really didn't have a lot of involvement to be honest with you because I worked 10 hours a day. The early intervention I think got Jake a really good jump on his education. And then when it came to going to public school, the area we lived in was not, it was a a little rural area. So I did a lot of research online looking for where we needed to be, what school zone we needed to be in. So we actually 
moved into this school zone based on my research for the best schools for special education. Now, did we want to move? The answer was no. We had lived there 25 years and raised our girls there. But, you know, looking back, I wouldn't, I wouldn't have it any other way. It was meant to be. And, you know, I didn't have to do a lot of pushing for inclusion when Jake was in elementary and middle school. They already had begun that process. He had some wonderful teachers and mentors, peers. To be honest with you, when I look back, the students were his biggest supporters. That's inclusion. That's what inclusion does and what it puts in society because I can only think that Jake's friends and peers, uh, how he changed their life. I mean, it's a, it's a mutual relationship as every relationship is. We impact each other, but there's so many great gifts there. Jake, did you like school? Oh, yes, ma'am, I do. He goes, I like meeting new friends at school. Jake loves people. He loves his friends. Jake has a lot of typical friends. Um, but Jake goes out a couple of times each week. He, he stays in contact with all his typical peers independently. I have nothing to do with it. He'll text. They make phone calls back and forth. He'll make plans with them on the weekend. And he'll say, Mom, I'm going with Matt to lunch. Tuesday or Saturday and and he has arranged for Matt to come pick him up he knows what time he gets ready and they'll go out to lunch and maybe to a movie or ice cream and spend some time he's played top golf with friends he does very a lot of activities with typical peers Jake you should tell them about Nolan yeah oh yeah um so my friend is Nolan Tono Me and him went to the same high school together, and then he plays football for Clemson. When I was in Clemson on Fridays, like when I get done with classes early at one, and he takes me to lunch. And then you had some other friends on the football team too? Yes. I I got like three of them. So his other friends are the uh, Edwards twins, uh, Jacob and James. And James Kowski, Will Sweeney, Drew Sweeney, BT Pardo. I know all of them peers. I used to work with the football team every Tuesday. Did you like working with the football team? Yes, ma'am. What did you like most about working with the football team? So at the football complex, so I cleaned down like equipment down and I get it like in the the football players like get on like massaging thing, and they and then I could clean it down, and then I worked with the uh, Clemson Police Department. I did um dispatch, patrolling, and training with the canines. When you were at Clemson, you lived on campus, correct? Yes, I did. I want to apologize for. Um for pausing so much because I want to be able to articulate my questions. And and at the same time, I'm so interested in everything that you've done and, and how it felt from the inside and, and what it meant and what was your, what were your favorite things? Because I just, I, I look at you and I, I think of my son and I think of how he'll feel going to college. And so you lived you lived on campus. You lived on your own, ind- independent living, correct? Yes, ma'am. And, and then I also got roommates, too. My roommates are Matthew Hawkins, Kaleem, and Chris. Kaleem and Chris, tell them who they were. They were new freshmen when I was a sophomore in Clemson Life. Matthew, so he does work for Clemson Life, but... He told me he's coming down to Birmingham because he has a job in Birmingham. Do you remember what Matthew's title was, what they called Matthew? Oh, he's an ILA. Right. So Matthew was their ILA. So it's a four-bedroom dorm. And so Matthew's job is called an independent living assistant. He's actually employed by Clemson Life. And they live together in a four-bedroom student apartment. Um, And so Matthew's basic job was to 
check and make sure that Jake and his other roommates were meeting their goals, doing their things they were supposed to do. They would have to check in with Matthew. They have levels and depending on what is it, explain the levels, Jake. You can explain that better. Okay. So the levels, probably like level one, your, your bedtime is like nine o'clock and then we turn off the advisors off and then we get ready for class and then on level two, about nine. And on level three, no curfew. Level three is the best place I can like. Last time when I went to a basketball game for Clemson, place, I used to have a friend on that team. And then I walked to the game by myself. So they, depending on what level they were on, they would earn points to be on their levels. And then if like they did something incorrectly, they could lose points. But depending on what level they were on, that how much they had to check in with their ILA. So like on level three, you have like complete freedom. Like you can say, he could say, hey, Matthew, I'm going to the basketball game. I'll be back after it's fine. But if you're on level one, for instance, um, you have to be in bed at nine unless you have an ILA going with you to the activity. They gradually earn their freedom there to where they get to do everything they want to do. So Jake really liked to be on level three. <laughs> level three is the best piece. You can like stay up and past 10 o'clock. What, what happened that one time that you got? Why did you get bumped down that one time? What did you do? Which one? When you, you went off campus, didn't you? Oh, yeah, uh, I did, Pierce. I was hanging out with my friends off campus. They have to stay on campus. That's the one rule. Like, even if you're level three, you have to be on campus. And I think Jake decided, was it Moe's you decided you wanted to cut? I told Matthew I can, like, go to Moe's. Pierce, I got my own yeah. like, gift card for Moe's. Yeah, he wanted to go somewhere to eat off campus and got knocked down to level two for a little while. He wasn't very happy about it. I still think he argues that he shouldn't have been knocked down. He told Matthew where he was going. I, I told Matthew where I'm going. <laughs> Amy, being his big sister and knowing the limits that get put on people with Down syndrome, how does it feel to just see him in this in- inclusive world, just being able to thrive and reach his potential and set goals? You know, Jake has stopped surprising me at this point. He's just everything that that he's ever been told no about, he makes it happen. And so I just, I don't, I don't get surprised by anything he does anymore. I just, I fully expect if he wants to do something, it's going to happen. Like his new thing is he tells me he's going to buy a Lamborghini and he will probably have a Lamborghini one day. I mean, it's just, he came home and said, I want to go to college. And we had never heard of any of the programs like Clemson Life and those are popping up everywhere now, but we didn't even know those existed. And I'll never forget my mom saying, how are we going to look at Jake and tell him this is not something you're going to be able to do? You know, we, we doubted him and, um, you know, (laughs) Jake never doubted for a second. He told us I'm going to go to college and we found the Clemson life program through, it was like that viral video that went viral several years ago where the boy got accepted and was opening the letter. I don't know if you guys saw that. And um, I remember seeing that video and calling mom and saying, what is this program? What is this about? And we started researching. And sure enough, we found out about Clemson Life and all these other programs around the country. And that was it. You know, Jake was, I'm going to Clemson Life. He made that his mission. And in the football team, Jake said ever since he was in middle school, he wanted to play on the football team. So Jake, you want to tell them a little bit about how the football team happened? Oh, yes, I can. So I played football in high school. We went to like Auburn, Alabama for the championship game. I got to go in the fourth quarter uh, of the game when we played uh, Broward Christian High School. And I scored a big green touchdown. How did you feel about going into the game? Uh, I felt really good because I was really, I was feeling tough. You felt prepared? Yeah, so. I've been in a lot of uh, football practices and camps. I want to try and be like the other guys. I, I like to play football with my football friends. Like Alabama football players, they went to the same high school as me. Auburn, Tennessee, and Ole Miss friends. They cheer me on when I scored a touchdown. So the story of the football team is, you know, Jake loved football and he told his middle school teacher he wanted to play football in high school. And um, he was a manager in 11th grade. 
So, you know, it was coming upon his senior year and I started asking around, I said, what are the requirements to play football? What are the requirements? Well, anybody can play. I said, really? So everybody that goes out for the football team makes the football team? Yes. I said, okay, so what forms do you have to fill out? They said a medical form. So I, I didn't ask anybody. I got the medical form. I took it to his doctor. He filled it out. He approved it. And so then I asked for a meeting with the principal, the athletic director, and the coach. Well, the coach is an older gentleman. He's been in his job 42 years. And so we had the meeting and I said, Jake wants to be on the football team. This was the spring before his senior year. So this was in January. I started before he even started his senior year. And I said, Jake wants to be on the football team. What's the requirements? And they said, well, he would have to come to every practice, every weightlifting Sometimes it's two a days. I said, okay, no problem. Jake's signing up for the team. And he said, well, well he, he can't do that. He's sick. And I said, what? He said he's sick. And I said, well, here's this filled out, completed, signed medical form. And I pulled it out of my folder and put it on the table. And our doctor happened to be the same doctor that the coach's children had gone to when they were growing up. And so the coach looked at it and he said, it has to be on our form. I said, this is your form. And so the principal and the athletic director were all on board and they said, Jake can play. So Jake went to, he didn't miss any practices. He went to every practice. He did the two a days. He didn't have any support, none. We didn't ask for Jake to have any support. We didn't feel like he needed it. So when it came time for a week away at summer camp, <laughs> it was the first time Jake had been away from home without anyone, us or Amy, alone. And so he goes with the whole football team to summer camp and they were going to pair the guys off in rooms. He was going to have a roommate, but they got there and they said, oh, we've got something great for the seniors. They get to have their own rooms by themselves. So Jake was in a room by himself. He had to set his alarm, get dressed, get ready for practice, be up at five o'clock. <laughs> was that fun, Jake? Yes, it was fun. <laughs> And the guys that were on the team came to me and my husband and they said, we don't know what Coach Anderson's going to do when we start playing, but if he doesn't let Jake go in to for some downs, we're going to push for it. So it was there again, his peers that came to love him and accept him as one of their own that said, Coach, we want Jake in the game. As a parent, that is one of the most beautiful things I've heard about Down syndrome and, and the way I think about Liam. I, I just, I, I believe that support will be there and is there, but to hear about it. But it can't be there unless it's an inclusive environment. And that's what we're always fighting for. I think you look at Jake's success and you look at him. And first of all, he has that drive to that I'm going to accomplish anything. But if you're not in an inclusive environment, if the only person that was there to make that decision was that coach that's been coaching for 42 years that looked at him as sick, that's what puts limits. And I see and I, I, I'm so amazed by your experience of inclusion. It's, and I always bring it down to inclusion because those kids were able to see Jake as an equal, see how hard he works and to stand up for him. But that doesn't just mean that they're standing up for Jake on the football field. They're standing up for other people in life. And it just makes such a profound difference to see Jake when people are telling him he can't. So you're, you're not only going up and having to rise to the standards of every other kid on that team, you've got to go one notch more and you have to rise above the person that's supposed to be supporting you, looking at you differently and less than, and still you do it. Still and sure, you, there's, there's inclusion in, in the kids around him that are supporting him but too. It's but it's the inclusion that makes Jake. the difference. It's yeah, the but then look at Jake changing. I mean, I don't know the story, but he must have changed the mind of the, of the, the head coach, coach after right? all this was done. This is how things change, and this is why exactly we wanted to talk to you, Jake. 
How did that uh, sleep away feel, <laughs> Amy, mom? <laughs> you know what? It, it felt like the beginning of a new chapter, and it, it was wonderful. Jake had his cell phone, and I could call him, and he didn't answer it. And he did not answer his phone for me when he was at Clemson. <laughs> he was having a good time, and he was independent. And, I, you know, I, I missed him, and I wanted to say hello to Jake and talk to him, but he, I knew at the same time Jake was moving ahead in his life and going on to bigger and better things. And I will tell you, um, the first student that included Jake as a friend, fully included him, you know, early on and would take him to football games with him and his friends. After he moved away, he was older, much older. And after he moved away, I pray, you know, I pray that the Lord would send other people like him. And every time those prayers were answered, you know, I would just pray, Lord, send more Daniels. Daniel is inclusive. I love Daniel. I need another Daniel. And the Lord wouldn't send one Daniel. He'd send three more. You know, it was wonderful. Yeah. Speaking of the, how did we feel when they went off independent, when um, they dropped him off at Clemson Life the first time for, as a freshman, I think we were far more freaked out than Jake was. Jake was like, leave. Y'all can go now. Bye. <laughs> well, what you told us, Jake, when we left you at Clemson. Oh, yeah. Later. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like, Jake, this is just you living your life. But are you aware that you're knocking down so many barriers and just even independent living or having a job or going to school? Are you aware that these are things that people don't think that you can do? I don't know about that question. You know what? I don't think he is aware. People will say he's been featured in all these videos and he's received all these accolades. It doesn't affect Jake. Jake, right? Jake, you don't tell him what you think about these things happening in your life. So in my life, I like hang out with friends and and walk. He, he does talk about how he likes to be a role model. He said he really likes um, hanging out with kids. Like they have had some events with Ruby's Rainbow and stuff where he's gotten to sort of mentor younger people with Down syndrome. So he has mentioned that like, Jake, what was your friend, that um, little boy that you met at the Ruby's Rainbow event? I think it was Kendall. Yes, Kendall. And you liked being a role model for him, didn't you? Yes, I did. I, I like being a role model for the kids. I can, like, help them to, like, do their own thing, like, go to college, get two jobs if they want to. They can live independently. They can do all that. And in college, you can, like, do a lot of events, like, hang out with a, a sorority. And uh, you can, like, go to a soccer game, football game, tennis, baseball, and football, all of that stuff. Amy uh, and and Jake, what have you seen in your life in regards to the attitude towards Down syndrome and the changes in that attitude? I I, I do think that we have seen a move towards more inclusion, you know, towards more acceptance, towards more awareness. I still think there's a lot of work left to be done, but um, but I do believe that that shift is happening and um you know, I believe things are getting better. I still don't think things are where they need to be. Um, And I think you guys would probably agree with that with, you know, the work you do, but that's how, you know, what you guys do is so important um, because just teaching people to be advocates um, is, is key here. And it's like, you guys were saying um, inclusion is great, you know, and it works, but you have to advocate for it for it to be put into place sometimes. And, um, you know, I think it's so important for people that have loved ones with Down syndrome to learn how to do that, to learn how to become an advocate, um, to learn, you know, how to push for those reforms and those changes. So that's why I think just stuff like this, bringing awareness um, is is crucial. And, you know, that's why we always jump at the chance for for Jake to do anything. Um, You know, and it's not just for attention or not just for likes it, it's it's just to show I mean Jake's just a normal guy you know and um we want people to see that and we want people to know that he's worthy he's capable and so are other people with down syndrome so um I really 
really appreciate what you guys are doing and you guys having him and myself and my mom on today. Um, very much appreciated. Well, we appreciate what Jake's doing and what you guys are doing as far as advocating. Because I think that's the really big thing is that we need to continue to advocate and to provide the supports, which I, I, I want to email your mom and find out some of the supports that, you know, for my own personal concerns are always speech. And, and Jake, you're so articulate. And, and I just want to know what support was there. So then I can ask for that support and implement it in my son. And I think, honestly, that's part of the journey is when you see Jake at 22 I want to know what got him there so that, because we don't know as parents what to ask for until we know what to ask for. Clemson Life, his program, I saw leaps and bounds in Jake's communication while he was in that program. I mean, when he was in high school, we would text and I would say that texting with Jake could be hit or miss. I would ask him a question and he would kind of say something totally different off the wall. Like he wasn't really good with like, especially written communication. He now can have a text conversation with me, just like I'm texting with anybody else. I feel like his his written communication really took off at Clemson. Um, I feel like his verbal communication skills have always been pretty good. I mean, of of course, I know mom can talk more about some um, therapy he did and some uh, support that he had there when he was younger and like with early intervention and stuff. He's always been a really good verbal communicator, but I would say that his written communication, the post-secondary program really helped with that. They focus a lot on life skills. They did cooking classes. They did um, learning how to go to the grocery store, how to budget, how to keep up with your checking account. And then they did written communication, emails, resumes, you know, functional forms of written communication. So I would say that was a big help to Jay. And mom, we haven't really officially met you. I'm sorry that we... We need your name. We, yes. This is uh, Lori and Stephen. Hi, Lori and Stephen. I'm Kathy. And um, I jumped on when we started talking about Jake's uh, verbal skills. I think some people would say I'm a tough mom. I have high expectations for my children. And so when he started speaking, if I couldn't understand him, I'd say, Jake, I don't understand that repeated. You know, I mean, some people think that sounds a little um, tough. I don't. <laughs> we find sometimes that that gap that gets bridged too easily where Liam doesn't have to complete. He can just kind of say one word and, and someone point. Will to know. The, and someone will try to bridge that gap to, to make it easier maybe for the whole situation. But that doesn't help Liam. Jake, do you remember that? Do you remember your mom correcting you and making you do it right? I don't think so. It's just routine for Jake. I mean, it, it really is. It's just part of the way we live. It's part of the way I've always lived my life. So it goes back to he's he's my son. You know, Amy's my daughter. They're, they're no different. And, you know, I have these expectations and I just try to, um, I wouldn't say I'm anything special. I've not done anything special. I've just been a mom. I haven't always put a, as much effort as you were explaining before, like making lists and, and you know, honestly, I when Jake was born and they said he had Down syndrome, I had already worked, I had already been working at the government at that time for 23 years, the federal government. And so I was not going to give up my career. And everybody was telling me, you know, it's you have a child and it's there's nothing different. And so I said, why should I give up my career? So I've continued to work. I've been there 43 and a half years now, and I, I need to retire. But um, Clemson, we never planned for Jake to go to college. So we didn't have a college fund. I did for the girls. So I would say start your college funds. <laughs> but I didn't have one for Jake. And so when it came time for him to go to college, of course, these programs are not just college tuition. They charge a large program fee each semester on top of the college tuition. So, and the housing and the meals, it was pricey. And, and one thing I will say is I did find out that um, it seems to me like the programs right now are catering to the more wealthy clients. And I believe we need to change. That's one of the things I see where we could change and bring forth change. That's why we were thrilled that UPS donated $25,000 for uh, scholarships 
for other um, children with Down syndrome to go to college. Those are necessary. We didn't, we couldn't take out student loans. We could, we didn't get any scholarships. You know, I had parents walking up to me going, my son got a free ride. And I thought, if I hear that one more time, I'm going to choke somebody. You know, they didn't know it was offensive to me or why. And I didn't want to go into the explanation of why. But I do want to put some awareness on the fact that these programs are pricey and they need to be inclusive to all of our community, not just the wealthy ones. So it was a little hard. It's amazing that there was no scholarship out there for Jake. That is just, that's a shame. That is where we have failed somewhere as a society because everything that he's done and proven and worked so hard, he should have had a scholarship. I'd love to talk to you more about these programs and how to bring awareness that, that they're not, you know, to make them accessible and open to the entire community because it shouldn't, it shouldn't be how it is. And hopefully that kind of awareness would make it easier to approach these programs. I I would think that most of society would believe that they are accessible. And I, I would love to know what their thoughts on making them inaccessible would be because it's a failure. Yeah, I would assume most of the public would be unaware of the fact that it would And a cost. bit of a bit yeah. of outrage. Yeah. Right? Absolutely. They are unaware. And then we did we got a small I mean, Ruby's Rainbow has done a great job. And there are so there he did get I think he got three thousand dollars, but when you're talking about fifty thousand, three thousand isn't much. When you're writing a check, forty seven thousand dollars one semester. You know, and you're just, we're just your typical middle-class family. My husband's a lineman at AT AT&T. I work for the government. So we're not special people. We're just average working class. I'm approaching retirement age. I could have retired, but I chose to continue working so we could fund this program and get Jake to the point to where we thought he could live independently where he could work independently, you know, and I see those things coming to fruition and it, it's worth all the effort. Well, this story is inspirational because not only do you rise to the challenges and you're knocking down barriers, but it's the best example of inclusion and equality that can be told with proof. And it shouldn't have to be something that we have to prove. Jake, you should be able to go and get a job and no one should ever question that there's anything until you prove that there's something that would be a challenge. But unfortunately, right now, that's how it is. And your story will help to change that, to change Mm -hmm. that for my son. Uh, And mom, you say you didn't do anything special, but it's hard. It's hard. Everybody does what's best for their family. And it shouldn't be that it's different for your neurotypical children, for your daughter, that, that shouldn't have been a different path in any other way than independently how they would have, their choices would have made it a different path. But you're, you're advocating and just even moving and the things that you've done, that's a big deal. And you probably heard some no's, you know, when it came to your, your other kids too, but you know, you, you probably heard a lot more no's when you're going through with Jake and uh, you're a wonderful advocate. And it teaches people to advocate because I I think that we all advocate to the best of our ability, but sometimes that gets hindered. We don't even know what that is sometimes. We don't, yeah, we don't know what it is, but also it gets hindered because there's no way that if you're told no all the time, that that's some of that, no matter how, how much you believe, yes, some of that no. Can wear you down. Yeah, it can wear you down. But when you see yes, then you have something in your pocket to remember and to think of. But you were on the forefront. We get to see Jake. And we he's get a, to see Jake. Yes. And we get to, Jake, we get to see your ability. And we get to, not, no, we don't get to see your ability. We get to see you. And we get to see the possibilities being done. We're not the first ones having to do it. Because the first, the first man who went into space and orbited the earth. And then after that, many people could do it. You make it possible not only by doing it, by letting people know it's possible. Does that make sense? We don't have to be the ones to forge the path. We can see that you've already cleared some of it for us. It makes the walk a little bit easier. I feel like in some ways, this is a repeat of of stories from the past. 
a lot of different groups of people and cultures have fought the same fight for equality. I just feel like even though we're one of the most marginalized communities, I feel like we are just getting up to speed, you know, but I feel like we're walking a familiar path. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, I totally agree. Jake, um, what advice would you give my son, Liam? Your son can like do like independent living. He can go to college and work hard. And you've shown that to be true. And we appreciate not only what you'll, you'll show our son, but what you're showing us and parents all over the world. We're a big community and we believe these things. We believe these things are true. And sometimes we um, need to see them, need to see them, or at least it does help to see them. It does help to see them. And uh, you're an example and a reason for inclusion to be seen. Like you're an example. When I go into my IEP, I'm going to talk about you, Jake, and I'm going to talk about the importance of inclusion. And there's so many other things that you're doing in your life that are breaking down barriers. I want to know more about you and, and what you do and what you accomplish. Do you, what are your dreams? What are your goals going forward? So my dreams, I'm um, trying to get married one day to my girlfriend, Grace. i um, trying to get my own lumber one day and get a own house and get my own YouTube channel. But wait, tell her what the second thing, get your own what? I always said it. Say it again because... The Lambo. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Lamborghini. Oh, yeah. Tell them about that house you want that you saw. So that house I saw in... Uh, where we live in uh, Birmingham, Alabama, in Hoover, I want to live at the Black Ridge on a lake, a lake house, and I can get my own boat, and I can get my own seat. You talked when you talked about wanting to be on the football team, about wanting to be like everybody else. And that's it. That's Those are your dreams. You, you dream just like everybody else, the same dreams that everybody has and you're doing a great job at pursuing those dreams. And I think that's it. I think that's it, Jake. What I learned from you is that I can look at my son and know Liam is going to be Liam. He's not going to be affected by what other people think about him because that's not his focus. Maybe, maybe that's my reality and, and my knowing because I'm on the outside fighting those fights. And it's okay for me to fight those fights if the result of those fights are that Liam just gets to be Liam. Liam gets to dream what he wants to dream and he gets to accomplish what he's going to accomplish. Just just like my daughter, I, I, I so enjoy talking to you. I so enjoy being able to have a conversation with you. Jake, Kathy, Amy, thank you for joining us today. Yeah, thank you guys. Thank you so much for having us. We enjoyed talking to you. Thank you and goodbye. Please follow us on Twitter at If We Knew Then Pod, and you can drop us a line on our Facebook page at If We Knew Then Pod, or visit our website, If We Knew Then.com, to send us an email with questions and comments. And you can join our mailing list there and get alerts of future podcast episodes. All these links will be added to this episode's show notes. Thank you again, and we look forward to you joining us on the next episode of If We Knew Then. Thank you.